And it is also an honor to get the chance to introduce our, our second uh, keynote speaker and our concluding speaker of the day, uh, my friend Avery Posey. Um, and so let's just, Avery is an assistant professor in the Department of Systems Pharmacology and Translational Therapeutics at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's also a member of the Parker Institute, which is how I've gotten to know him over recent years. He's been recognized in a number of different contexts, including the Cure Search Young Investigator Award. He trained in Carl June's lab, where he made important contributions to uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, CAR T cells, and now has his own group at Penn uh, that is making a number of important contributions to expand the utility of CAR T cells for a broader range of indications. So I am looking forward to, to Avery's talk, which is entitled The Sweet Side of CAR T cells. Avery, thanks for coming. Thank you, Alex. I, I chuckled today because it's funny that I'm giving a keynote speech uh, about uh, in, a, in a symposium of genomic immunology, and I don't consider what I do genomic immunology. Uh, my PhD is in genetics. Um, but I think for most of us to work in the area of CAR T cells and, and, and those that are trying to move a therapeutic forward, I think what we do is more applied molecular biology, molecular genetics. Um, my lab definitely has interest in synthetic biology and a lot of the genetic screens that uh, Alex has done and some of the work that Wendell Lim and Cole Roybal has done. So I'm definitely in your fan club. Um, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we do today, which I think uh, will combine both immunology and, and gene therapy with some biochemistry. Uh, so the title of my talk is The Sweet Side of CAR T Cells, uh, because we focus on reprogramming T cells to target glycopeptide epitopes uh, and also glycolipids uh, for uh, uh, cancer therapy. And, and this fits into the broader um, uh, uh, class of T cell immunotherapies that includes cytokine therapies and therapeutic vaccines, bispecific antibodies, checkpoint blockade, and then the adoptive cell therapy arm uh, that includes tumor infiltrated lymphocytes, but then also the genetically modified uh, cells, such as the TCR engineered T cells and, and CAR T cells. And I, I really fell in love with this, this field because of the, the complexity of T cells, um, the potential for T cells to, I'm gonna move my, these videos out of the way. Um, the complexity uh, of T cells, the ability to clear infections, to recognize foreign invasions. But with cancer, we run into a, a limitation in that most of our, uh, most of the targets that might um, look like good cancer targets because they're, they're antigens that are overexpressed, they're amplified, um, maybe mutated, um, those will not be recognized by our immune system. Um, because we, our T cells have been tolerized. And then also another common mechanism for uh, tumor escape is loss of MHC. And so we, we, we need strategies uh, to overcome tolerance uh, and to direct the immune system towards tumor cells. Um, and, and you just saw MHC believe that antigen presenting cell or tumor cell. Uh, so CAR is a synthetic molecule that combines uh, the antigen recognizing ability of an antibody in, in most CARs uh, that uses an antibody uh, into an uh, reformat it in a single chain variable uh, format, uh, combined with the intracellular signaling um, uh, molecules necessary to activate and co-stimulate a T cell. And so that uh, gives us different generations of these chimeric antigen receptors. I'm sure this is a, probably a, an overview that uh, uh, may not be needed for this group, but for anyone who, who may not know this uh, yet, uh, I think this, this may still be important. And so there are different molecules, different, different generations of chimeric antigen receptors. First generations that included just a CD3 zeta um, intracellular signaling domain. Uh, those were not as effective uh, in terms of long-term persistence uh, in, in both in animal models and in humans. Uh, and so it was in the 2000s that uh, Mernia Brinjan from Memorial Sloan Kettering and others demonstrated that the inclusion of a co-stimulatory domain uh, in that intracellular tail of the chimeric antigen receptor enhanced the effector functions of those T cells, enhanced persistence and durability of responses. Uh, and there have been subsequent generations that include multiple co-stimulatory domains. Uh, that would be a third generation. And then there are now fourth 
and potentially fifth generation of chimeric antigen receptors that include um, the expression of additional effector molecules. Importantly, uh, CARs get around um, the re requirement for MHC recognition. So one chimeric antigen receptor that's made in a laboratory would work in T cells uh, of, of, well, of everyone on this on this call, um, they aren't they aren't specific to any HLA, um, and they will also work in CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells because they don't require the co-receptor. Uh, a limitation of these chimeric antigen receptors is that uh, they must target a molecule on the cell surface. However, that molecule doesn't necessarily need to be a protein, as antibodies can be developed to recognize uh, multiple different uh, macromolecules, peptides, nucleic acids, uh, carbohydrates, and lipids. Um, at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and other groups, uh, other institutions, um, chimeric antigen receptors are generated through the use of viral vector transductions of um, normal primary, uh, sorry, of, of uh, uh, peripheral blood T cells. Um, this can also be done with retroviral vectors, uh, transposons, um, uh, and as well as more specific integrations, uh, as Alec Marson has showed us, as Justin Equium has showed us. Um, so I'm gonna give you a, a schematic of how this is done for us. We take peripheral blood T cells, um, transduce them with a lentiviral vector that we generate in our laboratory. Um, that causes those T cells with their own native TCR that has its own recognition for some MAC peptide complex. Uh, now to also recognize um, these, the antigen targeted by the antibody that's found at, now at the extracellular domain, at the found on the, uh, on the membrane of these T cells. Uh, in this case, these are CAR T cells targeting CD19 with an anti-CD19 SCFB. Uh, when those T cells are reinfused or, or come back into contact with uh, CD19 positive cells, whether they're B, normal B cells or malignant B cells, uh, they lyse the CD19 positive cells because they recognize them uh, via the CAR. Uh, this, this process occurs uh, clinically through the uh, removal of T cells from a patient. Um, some groups purify T cells, some do not, but those T cells are then activated uh, with uh, usually anti-CD3, CD28 uh, antibodies uh, genetically modified to express a chimeric antigen receptor. Uh, T cells are expanded. Um, they go through a QA, QC process before they're cryopreserved uh, and, and reinfused into the patient. This is data from the first patient that was treated at Penn um, targeting CD19 with these anti-CD19 CAR T cells. This individual was uh, had chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, one day before infusion, these are CD19 positive, CD5 positive, uh, IG kappa positive B cells uh, circulating in the peripheral blood of that individual. And one month after infusion, all of those cells are gone. And so I think that this data uh, shows the potential for these types of therapies to eradicate uh, a tumor. And, and where my lab is interested uh, is how do we get that into solid tumors? How do we see um, uh, CAR T cells work in uh, very deadly tumors um, like pancreatic cancer? Um, those types of T cell therapies have been FDA approved. Um, and this is the first that was approved. It, it started at University of Pennsylvania. It was developed in Carl's June's group. Um, its name is, is Kim Raya. That's its uh, trade name. It's also called Tisagen like new cell. Uh, and, I, and I include this slide to point out some of the, um, the uh, side effects that may be possible. They're in the black box warning of these cells. Uh, and that's cytokine release syndrome. It's a condition that we did not observe in preclinical models, only observed it first in, um, in uh, the first child that was treated with uh, CAR T cells. And then there's the neurological toxicities uh, that can be uh, severe, life-threatening. Uh, most are transient. Um, and we had not known for quite a while why these neurological toxicities existed, um, but work in collaboration with um, uh, actually many investigators here, but the most principal uh, players are um, a graduate student, Kevin Parker at uh, Stanford, uh, Dennis Miglarini, who was in my group, but he now runs his own lab at University of Geneva, uh, Ansu Sapathy, and Howard Chang at Stanford. Um, this work started with an identification that Kevin made um, while at home um, 
doing what he does when he's at home, going through single cell sequencing data sets. Uh, he looked through uh, publicly available single cell sequencing data sets of developing brain and, uh, and identify in the non-neuronal subset of cells, uh, which included astrocytes, lymphocytes, uh, microglia, uh, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, and pericytes or endothelial cells, a population of cells in the brain that um, express uh, markers characteristic of pericytes like CD248, um, do not express markers characteristic of B cells like CD79A or CD20 or CD22, but do express uh, CD19, which is the target of um, the, the CD19 CAR T cells that, as I mentioned, uh, have been shown to cause neurotoxicity in patients. So that opens up the idea that maybe um, the reason why patients are developing neurotoxicity is because these CAR T cells are targeting this rare population of cells found in the brain. Um, and indeed, the expression of CD19 was as abundant um, in terms of the number of transcripts in the brain was as abundant as markers that we use to, to classically identify pericytes like CD248 and FOXF2 and uh, PDGFR beta. Uh, this was identified not only in that one data set, but in, in other data sets that have been publicly available as well as uh, in subsequent single cell sequencing that was performed at Stanford um, from fresh samples. Um, and at, at the University of Pennsylvania, we jumped into this because we, we wanted to model this. And so um, using black six mice uh, and working with uh, Yvonne Milliard's lab at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Dennis demonstrated um, that he could identify in the brain of black six mice a population of cells that was uh, CD45 positives and CD19 positive, but also a population of cells that were CD45 negative and CD19 positive. And this was after a stromal um, compartment enrichment of the, of the mouse brain. Um, importantly, uh, CD19 was not identified in other pericytes, such as lung pericytes, um, or in uh, lung vascular muscle cells and brain endothelial cells or lung endothelial cells. It was only in that one compartment uh, brain pericytes, and not all brain pericytes, but a subset of them. Um, that, that's demonstrated here. So we, we wanted to model this. So we, we made um, uh, human T cells targeting, uh, using our, our CAR backbone that either contains 41BB co-stimulation or CD28 co-stimulation. Um, and as a control, we use our FMC63 um, antibody that targets human CD19, doesn't recognize mouse CD19, but we include it into these cars uh, and the SEFB of 1D3 that targets murine CD19. And when we fuse these T cells, these are human T cells infused into NSG mice on this top row. Um, and then uh, they were uh, uh, infused into the mice for seven days. And then we injected into the mice mannitol uh, in a group of mice that's a positive control for opening up the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we also injected into the mice uh, Evans Blue dye. Uh, and after 30 minutes of Evans Blue dye in injection, we sacrificed the mice, um, we fixed the brain, and we looked for a fluorescence of Evans Blue dye in the brain. And so you can see uptake of Evans Blue dye or the fluorescence of Evans Blue dye was increased in mice that have been treated with the murine targeting CAR T cells, uh, but not the human targeting CAR T cells or mice that had not been treated at all. Uh, and this was enhanced for mice that have been treated with CAR T cells that uh, were co-stimulated by CD28 over 41BB. And it is, it is known that CD28 CAR, co-stimulated CAR T cells are more um, uh, potent than 41BB uh, co-stimulated CAR T cells. Uh, we showed this in an NSG mouse model. We repeated this assay in uh, immune competent and black six mice and, and showed similar trends. Um, and then we went back to our NSG mouse model and, you, and working with some um, investigators in radiation oncology who uh, at Penn, uh, we demonstrated uptake of gadolinium as well through high resolution uh, MRI. Um, so similar, um, similar observations that, that we do see uh, blood brain barrier permeability after treatment with CAR T cells that target mirroring CD19. And so this correlated um, the, the increased blood brain barrier, blood brain, BBB permeability uh, of CAR T cells 
uh, co-similarly with CD28, that increased permeability uh, correlated with what had been observed in the clinical trials um, of these CAR T cells that led to approval and that those uh, CAR T cells that target um, CD19 with a CD28 co-stimulation, uh, patients had increased um, grade three neurotoxicity. And so for us, this um, may explain why that neurotoxicity exists, but it also um, gives my lab new interest to now look at also, in addition to solid tumors, to look at hematopoietic malignancies for ways that we could increase the uh, specificity towards the tumor and away from uh, CD19 positive brain parasites. Uh, from here, I switch now to a completely different topic, but hopefully you'll be able to see the, the through line. Um, we're interested in how we make these CAR T cells move forward to solid tumors. How do we get them to, uh, and this cartoon was drawn by uh, one of my cousins, uh, how do we get them to focus on the diseased area of the tissue and leave the, re the remaining force um, unharmed? how do we get to tum truly tumor specificity? And for my lab, we're, we think that differential glycosylation uh, and other post-translational modifications should be considered in this, in this area. Um, and so we're focused on um, many of these, we're interested in them, uh, but we're mostly focused on these truncated O-glycans um, because they have a long history of being demonstrated uh, to be only found in, in solid tumors. Um, and actually that was an early discovery uh, in the eighties. Uh, this review um, uh, suggested that over 80% of adenocarcinomas express this one carbohydrate called the TN antigen. Um, and I wanna give you a, a glimpse into how cells actually um, take up the TN antigen or express the TN antigen. So um, as cells are glycosylated, this is O-glycosylation. So this occurs in the Golgi. Uh, on serines and threonines that are going to be oligosylated, they're recognized by a family of, um, of um, galnac transferases called, um, well, galnac transferases. There's about 20 of them. They recognize uh, the proteins with some polypeptide specificity, and they add uh, one carbohydrate, N-acetylgalactose, uh, to those serines or threonines, and that antigen is called the TN antigen. Uh, there is an additional um, carbohydrate added on top of the TN engine by one enzyme, c one gal t one that has a chaperone protein that is required for proper folding. Uh, that new um, carbohydrate is called the core one glycan or the T antigen. And then that is further elongated um, by other enzymes that recognize that carbohydrate, that galactose and add to it other um, sugars. But if you lose if your cell loses um, this enzyme, this common enzyme, or the chaperone protein associated with it, uh, then you can never form that core one glycan and that can never be elongated. Uh, and so your cells end up exposing at the cell surface protein that has this truncated residual carbohydrate called the TN antigen. Uh, there is one enzyme that will recognize that TN antigen and add to it sialic acid, and that's called a sial TN antigen, both of these are considered to be uniquely um, associated with cancer and not found uh, on the surface of normal tissue. Uh, and, and colleagues of mine at the University of Copenhagen in the uh, Copenhagen Center for Glycomics um, have demonstrated that if you, if you knock out that chaperone protein, COSMIC, that's required for proper folding of the, of the T synthase or c one gal t one these uh, cells, this is a, a cell line, it's uh, H-A-C-A-T or HACAT cells, uh, that is a immortalized skin line. It's not malignant, it's been immortalized. Um, if you knock out cosmic, those cells will express the TN antigen on the cell surface. They'll also express the sial TN antigen. They lose the expression of the T antigen and another carbohydrate that I didn't talk about, but it's elongated after the T antigen, sial T. Uh, those cells lose that, and that you expect because T synthase is important for generating the TN engine. But functionally, those cells then become more invasive, uh, both in vitro um, as well as in vivo. Uh, and they also exhibit gene changes. So they exhibit changes that are associated with oncogenesis, like loss of PPD3 expression. Uh, so that suggests that changing cells that do have this TN antigen expression on their surface or sial TN antigen expressions may be the cells that we actually want to target. They may be the most malignant cells of, of a tumor. 
Um, and so there are different types of ways that we could target these different uh, carbohydrates on, on protein sequences that might actually be the same. Um, and, and so many of these reagents exist. Um, there are antibodies that recognize, for instance, a D-glycosylated peptide um, called, and this is, this is, these are antibodies all specific to MUC1. Uh, SM3 has been utilized as a chimeric antigen receptor before. It does recognize a D-glycosylated version of MUC1 that has no TN antigen, and, and uh, so it, has, it actually has no carbohydrates. Um, it does not care if this the threonine is glycosylated with TN antigen, uh, the antibody will still bind, but it is blocked after further elongation. So it could still, rec still, could still resemble um, a tumor specific or more tumor specific version of an anti-MUC1 antibody. Um, there, are, there are antibodies that recognize these carbohydrates alone uh, in the absence of this polypeptide backbone, like a anti-TN uh, antigen we have circulating uh, most of us have circulating anti-TN antigen antibodies, uh, but they, they are they typically exist as IgMs, never as IgGs. And there are uh, anti sil TN antigens. Uh, there's one that's actually really famous uh, in the world of antibody engineering, B72.3. It's an antibody that was used to, um, to model a lot of antibody engineering uh, work over the, through the 80s and 90s. Um, it, targets an antigen called SILTN, but this has also been called TAG72, or tumor-associated glycoprotein of 72 kilodaltons. Uh, and then there's the antibodies, the class of antibodies that we're really interested in. Those are the ones that bind to both the carbohydrate, that TN antigen, but also require that polypeptide backbone. They have affinity for the, the peptide as well. And so with that, we think that we approach more tumor specificity uh, than if we were to target uh, MUC1 alone, which is upregulated and overexpressed on many tumors, um, but it's also found on uh, just normal epithelial cells. Uh, and so that antibody 5E5 that recognizes the TMUC1, it was developed at the University of Copenhagen um, by collaborators Henrik Clausen and, uh, and specifically by his wife, Ulla Mendel, who, uh, who made the hybridoma for 5v5 uh, with her own hands. Um, she, uh, sorry, this antibody in our hands uh, does have high specificity for MUC1 with the TN antigen, but it does not bind to MUC1 without the TN antigen. Um, it does have some cross-reactivity to peptides that do not, uh, that are not MUC1. Um, but they require that TN antigen. So there's high affinity for TN antigen uh, and some lower affinity for MUC1 peptide. Um, this is immunohistochemistry of multiple tumor uh, microarrays and then some just um, FFP fixed samples um, showing that this antigen can be found in many different tumor types. Uh, and I marked with an asterisk, tumors that fall uh, in the uh, low mutational load category, like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, um, tumors that, although they may not have peptides that our T cells can recognize, we could engineer our T cells to recognize this combination of, of, sugar, pept of sugar and protein that uh, TMUC1 represents. Um, and then uh, again, this is immunohistochemistry demonstrating that um, normal human pancreas doesn't express TN antigen or TMUC1 on the cell surface, but uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma does, and it does so brightly. Uh, you will notice some uh, brown staining of the, uh, the anti-TNMUC1 antibody intracellular in normal tissue, and I'm going to show you a little bit about um, where we think that that's occurring. Um, so this is normal human kidney. Uh, it's been co-stained it's, it's co for EPCAM, uh, just as a cell surface marker, and then HMFG1, which is an antibody that recognizes normal MUC1. Uh, it doesn't have a, a uh, requirement of glycosylation. And um, we identify normal MUC1's expression at the cell surface and the, in the kidney. It's expressed in the lumen of the, of the uh, distal tubule. It's also expressed in the lumen of the glomeruli. Um, by contrast, TN MUC1, same with that anti uh, TMF1 antibody 5e5, is not found at the cell surface. It's very punctate in expression uh, in normal tissue and it's found more perinuclear. If we co uh, stain with a cis Golgi marker uh, instead of EPCAM, a cell surface marker, uh, we don't see localization between normal MUC1, which is, should be found at the cell surface. Uh, this is normal human pancreas here. 
uh, with the, it doesn't colocalize with the cis Golgi. Uh, but if you look at the colocalization between the TMF1 and the cis Golgi marker GM 130, you find that they do colocalize almost perfectly. And that's because this uh, elongation of, of, um, of oblate constellation does occur in the Golgi. So you expect in normal tissue, as much one is being uh, translated and post-translationally modified, that uh, the TN muck one would exist in this tissue, uh, but it should not be found at the cell surface. I mean, contrast that with a tumor. Uh, so this is breast cancer uh, and co-stain with EPCAM, and you can see bright expression of TN muck one here at the cell surface. So we utilize uh, the sequence. We sequence the hot, actually, University of Chicago sequenced the hybridoma of the 5 5 antibody, provided us the sequence. Uh, and we, we made a car out of that with our 41 bb co-stimulation. Um, it no longer has 41 bb co-stimulation, but I'll talk briefly about that in a, in a second. Um, and we showed that this car uh, secretes cytokines like IL-2 and interferon gamma when, culture, when the T cells, CAR T cells now, are cultured on peptide-coated plates, um, showing the same specificity as the antibody, that they have high specificity for the TNMUC1, uh, and some lower specificity for that um, peptide that doesn't, it's not MUC1, it's actually a sheep mucin um, that has the TN antigen, um, but it, it, there's no reactivity against MUC1 peptide alone. So the, the absence of that carbohydrate um, completely ablates the uh, specificity of the CAR. Uh, we demonstrated this, uh, the, the in vivo efficacy of these CAR T cells and our first model was a JERCAT model. And that's because JERCAT cells have been shown previously um, to express high amounts of TN antigen on their cell surface. So actually JERCAT cells have a uh, truncation, they have a, a one base pair deletion in the chaperone protein uh, and the gene that encodes for the chaperone protein for that T synthase cosmic. Um, that means that every single protein on the surface of a jerk cell that should normally be oak like oscillated has a TNA antigen instead. And so, uh, so that, that's a, a caution to anyone who's, who thinks that um, something they're studying in jerk cells uh, related to glycosylation may have um, um, uh, reproducibility in other cell types. Jerk cells are very unique. Uh, and so we in inoculated uh, mice with. Uh, 5 million jerk cells IV. And one week later, we imaged their tumor burden. Uh, the next day, we treated those mice with either PBS, non-transduced T cells, or anti-CD19 T cells that don't recognize jerk cells, uh, or two different groups, uh, two different doses of anti-TN Mach 1 CAR T cells. Uh, and you can observe in the control groups, uh, groups one, two, and three, that uh, there was no effect on tumor burden by any of those treatments, but the TMF1 CAR T cells uh, dramatically uh, decreased the tumor burden in these mice, showing that they were effective, um, similar to what we see with the anti-CD19 CAR T cells. Um, we made a model, okay, we made a, um, a cell line that re-expressed uh, full length cosmic um, with the bias electronic lentiviral vector that also included the expression of CD19. So we made these jerk head cells CD19 positive now, but they lose the expression of TN Mach 1. They also would lose expression of TN antigen for any other um, uh, oakley oscillated protein if you're interested. Um, and, and so that gives us a TN positive and TN negative um, cell line. Um, we then co culture with them non transduced T cells. T cells that target CD19 or T cells that target TM1 and could see reproducible loss, I'm sorry, reciprocal loss of either the TN negative CD19 positive cells with a CD19 car or loss of the TM1 positive um, CD19 negative cells with the 5 e 5 car or TM1 specific car. Uh, that shows us that the car can differentiate um, from in the same well, can differentiate the cells that are um, hypoglycosylated versus normally glycosylated. Uh, these CAR T cells are effective in other types of tumors. Um, we've evaluated uh, at, here in this work, uh, leukemia, pancreatic cancer, and breast cancer, but we've also looked at lung cancer and ovarian cancer and prostate cancer, and we're, we're really interested in prostate cancer now. Um, and, uh, and below, we, we did another xenograft model in which we demonstrated that these CAR T cells were effective. Uh, they cleared tumor in the mice in, in under three weeks. Uh, and the mice survive for over 115 days. So this shows that the, these TMF1 CAR T cells are effective against multiple cancer histotypes. Um, they were not more cytotoxic against normal human primary cells than our CD19 specific CAR T cells, uh, the blue line versus the red line. 
uh, in cell types that uh, either were not expected to express MUC1 or were expected to, to express MUC1, like renal epithelial cells or renal cortical epithelial cells. Um, so all of this um, made us enthusiastic about this target and about these CAR T cells. And so we moved forward to um, developing an IND application to start a phase one clinical trial. But first we evaluated um, which co-stimulatory domain might be ideal for these CAR T cells. And, um, and I, I wish I had known what talk was coming before. Um, uh, so some of the co-stimulatory domains we evaluate are CD28 or another signaling variant of CD28 called YMFM that we uh, published on um, uh, early last year, uh, where we can show enhancement of these CAR T cells persistence in vivo by um, altering the interaction between what we think is interaction between um, the CD28 co-stimulatory domain and GRAP2 VAF1 signaling pathway, but it, it may actually be a, another pathway that we um, have altered as well that may be contributing to that enhanced persistence. Um, but early work that I had done as a postdoc in Carl June's lab had been the inclusion of CD2 co-stimulatory domain uh, in a chimeric endocrine receptor in comparison to 4MBB and CD28. And, uh, and th there were multiple reasons for that that I won't go into today, uh, but in, in multiple models, including this model, we saw that the co CD2 co-stimulated CAR T cells were, uh, were most effective at eliminating uh, tumor in a stress model here, um, as well as enhancing the persistence of uh, at least CD4 CAR T cells. Uh, and, and we chose this uh, construct actually to go forward into a clinical trial. And so that is, has been open for over a year uh, now, but very slowed very much due to uh, COVID. Um, and this, this trial is sponsored by a pen spinout called Community Therapeutics. And it's a basket trial that's multi-center um, it's, there are six indications listed to the left, uh, including pancreatic uh, cancer, which uh, is near and dear to my heart. I lost an aunt on Wednesday to pancreatic cancer, and so much work needs to be done in this area. Um, so work with others, uh, including Hans Schreiber at the University of Chicago, has demonstrated um, that these TN peptide targeting CAR T cells, R5E5-CAR and his 237-CAR, which recognizes TN potoplanin, but it recognizes uh, um, the murine homologous potoplanin, which is called OTS8, um, that the CAR T cell has increased specificity for other peptides that we don't observe with the antibody. Um, I think it is known, I think it's well accepted now that CAR T cells have increased sensitivity for antigens that uh, over their, their native antibodies. Uh, and we think that this, this uh, data may suggest that uh, CAR T cells targeting TN peptides may have a greater range of targeting than just MUC1, for example, or potoplanin, for example, that they may target other TN peptides on the surface of that same cell, uh, assuming again, that that same cell has a general um, downregulation of O-glycosylation, and so that multiple proteins are expressing the TN antigen. We think that this may be a way to overcome antigen escape. So for instance, loss of MUC1 by the tumor or loss of protoplanet. That, uh, that of course remains to be seen. Um, my, my lab is interested in, in ways that we optimize uh, CAR T cells, and some of that work is generating these fourth generational um, CAR T cells that include a novel effector molecule in addition to the CAR. Um, these have been called armored CARs. They have also been called trucks. Um, and this is a representative map of a lintiviral vector that we use called PTRPE that includes our CAR TMF1 uh, as well as a cytokine. And uh, I can show you that in work here um, on the on Agilent's um, E site with the MCF7 breast cancer line that uh, ex expressing um, a red dye MK in the nuclei. When we add our CAR T cells to them, there's increased depth of the tumor modeled here with uptake of uh, green fluorescence, that's uh, anexin. Um, so, so green cells are dead. Um, that's more, more depth than we would see if we were to add non-transduced T cells to this culture. But if we add CAR T cells at the uh, same amount of CAR T cells that are also secreting uh, IL-7 
or IL-18 or three cytokines that we haven't yet disclosed, uh, we can enhance the activity of this. And understanding the mechanism by which they are enhancing this is important to us. Uh, so that's some of the work that we uh, have ongoing. Uh, we can also show that other uh, cytokines that we would constitutively express at the time of cold culture and actually uh, at the time of T cell transduction, briefly after T cell transduction, uh, if we secrete IL-12 from our CAR T cells, it actually limits the efficacy of our CAR T cells against the tumor. Uh, this is something that uh, I, others have um, uh, moved into the clinic, a constitutive expression of IL-12, uh, lower expression than we're currently expressing. Uh, that's because it's under the control of an iris. So CAR, iris, IL-12. Um, and others uh, are definitely interested in moving IL-12 in as an inducible cytokine. And this data at least suggests that constitutive expression is not, not the best idea. Um, other work, let me check where I am in time. I am running out of time. Uh, so uh, I'll go uh, fast through some of these this other work. So we're, we're also interested in ways in which we can engineer CAR T cells. Uh, we're already engineering them to target sugars. They don't naturally target sugars. So we're also interested in ways that we can also um, uh, move beyond what's known about T cell biology to, to target um, antigens that make it just to better tumor specificity and tumor control. And so um, in work um, that one of my postdocs has done, um, uh, we've developed CAR T cells that can target a glycoformer fibronectin that we believe is tumor specific, um, just based on what's, what's in the literature. So that's this schematic here is showing you T cells targeting uh, uh, proteins found in the stroma. Uh, that, that target is fibronectin. Fibronectin has three different domains that are thought to be more cancer associated, EDB, EDA, and V, or 3CS. Um, and there's an antibody that was developed at Fred Hutch by um, um, uh, Sin Ichiro Hakamori. Uh, that was the first antibody known to recognize a TN antigen peptide sequence. And so this for us became a, um, just going back to classics. Um, we utilized this antibody, it was available by the ATCC. Uh, we utilized this antibody to make a chimeric antigen receptor. Uh, it does, if you use it for immunohistochemistry, lights up the stroma beautifully. Um, and interestingly, we thought that this could be a, a nice SCFV to use for uh, like a sin notch system, which Cole Roy Ball and Wendell Lim have developed. Um, and, and it may, but actually as a car, it worked to uh, kill tumor cells in vitro. That's really interesting for us. Um, and so I'm showing you here lysis of uh, prostate cancer, Lyme, PC3, uh, cytokine secretion, uh, have lots of cytokine secreted, more than our TMF1 car does secrete uh, against this cell line. Um, we've looked into what mechanisms might exist, and this is very preliminary data, but we've generated some knockout controls for FAS and interferon gamma receptor um, and demonstrated that uh, at least our uh, uh, oncofetal fibronectin or TN fibronectin targeting CAR uh, has some requirement for FAS, has a lot of requirement for interferon gamma. We don't think it, it's mediated, it's killing is mediated by granzyme B. Um, some of that data is here. I'm going to skip through this um, in the interest of time. Uh, in vivo, these cells work to uh, reduce tumor burden, and that's this group here. Um, there is another cancer-associated uh, domain of fibronectin called EDB fibronectin, uh, and there's an antibody that has been used uh, in many different studies of antibody cytokine fusions and antibody toxin fusions to target EDB, uh, to target directly to the tumor. Uh, we utilized it and that antibody as a CAR as well and found that it was not as effective as our TN fibronectin targeting CAR. Um, and we see that these CAR T cells actually work faster than our, our TM1 CAR T cells. Uh, and so we're interested in, in combining the two uh, to try to get to multiple mechanisms of tumor killing, um, targeting the stroma and also targeting uh, the tumor. And I can show you that the speed of killing here uh, is, is faster for the fibronectin, the, 3CS fibronectin targeting, but the TMF1 does catch up and, and long story short, the TMF1 is still better. Um, these CAR T cells do infiltrate um, to the level of our TMF1 CAR T cells. Um, we see that the EDB fibronectin CAR T cells seem to um, associate more with vasculature, um, which is interesting. EDB fibronectin is thought to be a splice variant that is more associated with neovasculature. Um, and then it, when we 
do look at HME, many of our 3CS fibronectin CAR T cells, uh, my, the tumors treated with these CAR T cells look like this, where uh, there, it's not a whole tumor anymore. It's been broken up and it looks like the stroma has been altered. Uh, and so there's a pathologist that's working with us now to do some quantifications here um, to, to quantify what's, what may be happening. Um, and then the last bit of work, I think, I think I'm out of time on. Um, it is interesting to me. Uh, it involves some glyco editing and is inspired by work from Carolyn Bertozzi at Stanford um, that uh, focuses on a family of inhibitory immune receptors called Siglex. These are silic acid binding receptors that uh, contain ITIM motifs similar to PD-1 in T cells. Uh, except these receptors engage with silic acid that's uh, found uh, on the surface of cells and, hy and found hypersilylated on the surface of tumor cells. Uh, if you remove silic acid with an enzyme, uh, either a bacterial silic, uh, silidase or neuraminidase, same name, um, so, I'm sorry, same enzyme, two names for the same enzyme. If you remove silic acid with uh, that enzyme, a bacterial or human, uh, you can enhance uh, NK cell activity. And so we thought that we might be able to uh, do this with our CAR T cells. We engineer our CAR T cells to either secrete this enzyme, a human silic acid, or to express the cell surface version. And we can show that these work. These do uh, cleave off, excuse me, they cleave off silic acid on the tumor cell. Um, I'm going to skip and skip. Uh, and last last data slide, uh, they, they work well when, um, when our CAR T cells are expressing an, an enzyme engineered to express on the cell surface and co-cultured with NK cells at a low target um, effector to target ratio, uh, we can see uh, increased active anti-tumor activity elicited, elicited from that cooperativity uh, and is due to the silic acid uh, engineering. And importantly, CAR T cells are important here that uh, generate an anti-tumor response or T cell activation um, uh, we think is what's leading to communication between the T cells and NK cells for, for cooperativity with non-transduced T cells, none of that occurs. So T cells, I think are important first here. Um, so in summary, uh, we T cells that target alternative or abnormal glycoforms of tumor associated proteins may enhance the specificity of cancer targeting. Uh, that is where we uh, have put most of our eggs. Um, the ectopic expression of additional effector molecules in a truck format or armored car format um, may enhance CAR T cell activity. However, as I showed you with the IL-12, uh, that has to be critically evaluated. Timing of expression is important. Um, T cells that target extracellular matrix proteins of a tumor microenvironment, they do work, they are lytic. Um, and so this, this, for us, opens the door to evaluate other molecules as well. Um, and, and differential for us, differential glycosylation of those molecules um, that may be useful to enhance uh, T cell infiltration as well as enhance uh, tumor control. And um, inspired by work from Carolyn Bertozzi, glyco editing of the tumor and the tumor microenvironment by CAR T cells could be useful to elicit cooperative activity from auto unmodified innate immune cells. And here we model with in case cells, we think that this could also be important for um, other immune cells that are siglet expressing like uh, macrophages, um, dendritic cells, et cetera. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, members of my laboratory, um, collaborators and funding uh, and you for your attention and congratulations on your new institute. Thank you, Avery, that was a great talk, very exciting data. Um, too bad we didn't have more time for you. Um, but if you have some time, I will ask a couple of questions that came up. Um, have you studied how robust the expression of truncated MUC1 is over time in tumors in the context of CAR T selective pressure or with respect to its expression heterogeneity? That's a great question. And no, we have not. <laughs> we have not. Okay. Uh, there's one other. Um, fibronectin is also known to be enriched in the metastatic site. So do you think this would be an opportunity to improve T cell targeting metastasis? Yeah, yeah, we, we actually just completed a, a, a model where we were focused on um, liver metastases. Uh, so these are subcutaneous prostate tumors, um, but they do um, 
the mice do develop liver metastases. And uh, on a previous model, we noticed that there was a difference in the number of METs that we observed uh, when, we, when the mice were treated with these TN fibronectin targeting CAR T cells. And so we, we planned a model uh, to focus specifically on that, and we do see differences. Um, and so that's, that's really interesting for us. Great. Thank you for an awesome talk. Um, I have a question. Well, two questions. First of all, I think it's interesting that you don't consider yourself a genomic immunologist. You just gave a whole talk about synthetic programs that you're putting into T cells and also using single cell genomics. So I guess my first question is maybe you should reconsider uh, becoming a genomic immunologist. Um, but no, the serious question is, um, these, these loss of these enzymes that change the modifications on the surface, is that thought to be a driver process in, in malignant transformation? Um, I think so. I think so. Um, we've, we've done a little in this area, a little in this area, but really I'm depending on some collaborators there. Um, I think so, is my answer. <laughs> What I what I like actually from you, Alex, is uh, to think about ways that uh, I think that differential glycosylation uh, and using that with uh, T cell immunotherapies it has great potential. But um, we've only be begin to be able to explore this in a more high throughput way, um, and so combining what you do, the CRISPR screens that you do, with some of the um, biochemical technologies like um, like some of the new glycomics mass specs, um, how could that uh, move us forward a little I, faster than, than we have over the last few decades? I fully agree. And I think that that's exactly the type of collaboration I'd like to see and explore with you and others. I, I think that the, the, that combination will be extremely powerful, both for discovering targets and finding new ways to armor these T cells to make them work even better. Exactly. <laughs> 